So good afternoon. I'm Shannon Pete, and I am with the Human Early Learning Partnership. I'm the operations director there, and um, thank you, Ramona, for reminding us to introduce ourselves uh, thoroughly, or a little more thoroughly than normal. So I'm, I am a settler here, working and living in Vancouver, uh, and I come from. Um, my great grandparents were settlers in Alberta and Saskatchewan, um, and became farmers and teachers and social workers, which has interesting meaning, of course, uh, as a white person in an indigenous context. And so I'm really excited because I get to present with Diana, which I've not done before. I'm also a little bit nervous because I don't always get off the university campus. So yeah, you get both those things in me today. Um, thank you to Deborah for the excellent organizing and to ACT today for the food and, and bringing the day together. Uh, and thank you to all the presenters we've already heard. Uh, you're a hard act to follow, really. Uh, and, and mostly by the folks in the room, because I work at the university, I used to be a youth worker, so I used to be on the front line and really work closely with children and with families. Uh, and I don't get that closeness that I used to. And so whenever I'm in a room with people who work directly with children and with families, um, I'm inspired and I'm reacquainted with just how important it is that you're all doing the work that you're doing. So our work, we like to acknowledge our work does take place right on UBC, which is Musqueam territory, uh, the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Uh, we're very fortunate to work there. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And this is helps vision all children thriving in healthy societies. Uh, we were founded in 1899 by Dr. Clyde Hertzman, as Diana mentioned, and our current director is Dr. Kim Schonert Reichel, who some of you may have heard. She's uh, fairly well known in social emotional learning. HELP's mission is that we're dedicated to improving the health and well being of children through interdisciplinary research and mobilizing knowledge. And that's that part of really, um, we hope, taking research and making it useful to other people out in the world. Um, so we are a research unit, and um, though we don't, at least at the moment, we don't conduct research specifically on ASD, um, we do population level research. So that includes everybody in the population. So the th I think the three things that help is most well known for are three questionnaires, and I'll, I'll just go through this slide so that you understand what they are. So different than uh, something like the ASQ or the STAT that was mentioned earlier today, um, those are assessment tools, of course, that are, are important and meant to inform a plan for a specific child or a specific family. The questionnaires that HELP looks at are population level, so that they're filled out by a child or a parent or by a teacher about a child but they're never about making a plan for that individual child. We're trying to take all the information we can in say a school district or a neighborhood or maybe the whole province so that we can understand how are we doing for children in general in say the province of BC. So HELP um, gathers data on child development, on child vulnerability and on child wellness. And we do that mostly through the school system um, so let me talk about each of these in turn. We started with the EDI, you've heard Diana mention it, it's the early development instrument, and that's completed by all the kindergarten teachers in the province on each kindergarten child, uh, unless the family chooses to opt out, which of course is their choice, or if the school district chooses not to participate. It is a voluntary study. The MDI was the next one that was developed by our director now, Dr. Kim Schonert Reichel. It's the middle years development instrument. Uh, the MDI is completed by children themselves when they're in grade four or grade seven, and we're talking about expanding to other grades, um, maybe, maybe as soon as next year. Um, it's very strengths-based, and so talks a lot more about um, child wellness, what kids, uh, the important adults in kids' life, either at school or home or in their neighborhood, what they like to do after school, that kind of thing. The check is our childhood experiences questionnaire, and it's filled out by parents about their child, about the experiences that their child has had the opportunity to do um, in their time leading up to kindergarten. 
And the thought is, is it's a lovely companion to the EDI. If we find out about child vulnerability when kids are in kindergarten, well, that begs a lot of questions about what happened to make kids vulnerable or not, and what are the differences can, that can make the most difference is one of the questions we've been trying to answer for a long time. The TDI is still in development. Uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Martin Goon, is in charge of that one um, and is working really closely with a lot of communities to try and, and get it to be as useful as it can. Because it's on about toddlers, of course it's filled up by parents, but it then can't be run through the school system like our other tools. And so it's taking a little more time to figure out how do you ensure that you capture uh, as much of the population as you can if you're not in a place like a school where everybody already is. So when we're gathering data, we keep two main things in mind. We, we definitely want to report out on children's well-being as a way of continuing to influence local action and things like provincial policy. And as I mentioned, we try to understand the differences that make a difference by doing research on different aspects of children's experiences. Uh, I love what Rona said earlier about giving back when conducting research. We really believe in that too. So these beautiful people are our Aboriginal Steering Committee. Uh, HELP's been working with our Aboriginal Steering Committee since 2003. And some of these folks have been here the entire time. Right, Diana? Mm -hmm. uh, and many of them have been, been with us for years. So over 16 years, this amazing group of friends and mentors and colleagues have guided us in our work uh, and in our relationships. We have really tried, and, and I, think, I think we're there, we've, to have every voice be equal, tried to bring safety into the room so that every voice is equal. We don't base our committee on representation, though we try and have some geographical representation. We base it on passion and commitment. And at our meeting three weeks ago, uh, we started to collect stories from our ASC about this long-standing relationship, kind of what, what has come about in this relationship between our Aboriginal Steering Committee and HELP. Um, so as I talk, I'm going to read to you uh, some of the things that our members shared with us. So Carrie Ann, one of our members, was brought in originally as a HELP staff, our Indigenous liaison staff, uh, filling in on a maternity leave. So she remembers that the supportive environment she was brought into as a liaison um, while on maternity leave, while she was there, she admired the commitment of those on the ASC. She said, people have staying power, and that is a testament to the sense of community, of HELP, as well as the potential impact of the work. When she completed her mat leave, she was able to join the steering committee and she was really happy to be able to sit with the people who have made such amazing contributions. Um, just as a sidebar, we have a position open at the moment for a senior manager of indigenous initiatives. If you are one or know anybody, please talk to me after. So through our ASC, we've learned to see and understand the truth of colonization and the ongoing impact of residential schools. And through our, you, our ASC, we're moving along a journey which includes decolonizing ourselves uh, and, and basically everything that we do at HELP, really having deep conversations to rethink the way that we as an academic organization look at ourselves and our work. We're so deeply grateful for the commitment that the ASC has brought. Um, they've, they've sat through things even when hard. They've been patient and brought warmth and care to the relationship with help. Um, because even though academics are smart people, sometimes we are slow learners. So these are some of the ways that the ASC has influenced help. Um, Connie, one of our ASC members, said, the thing that stands out most in my mind is a conversation with Clyde about what happened to his family. We had a conversation that was so heartfelt, it made me realize that he was human, and my relationship with him stayed so connected from that time on. All the connections with all the people here have been valuable. We miss people who aren't here. So through those relationship connections, just as we've heard all day, 
Um, these are, are the aspects that we've really been able to um, work together with the ASC on. So we had to shift, in, in order to do this relationship well, we had to shift our organization in some pretty fundamental ways. Um, as, as Deborah mentioned earlier, one of the things we had to do was change how we thought about time, our expectations of time. We had to put more time into relationship building and trust building. We had to ensure that that time allowed for everyone to have a voice and it allowed for the time that they needed to speak so that folks weren't rushed. We had to change how we spent money um, in the academic context. Um, it took us a while, but we learned that a hot breakfast was really important to our ASC, that that actually started the day in a very different way for them than uh, something quick that we might have brought in um, for other groups. Uh, and that it was important to have enough food around the table to share with some of the other staff at help. That, that, that the idea of having breakfast together was an important way to have that relationship building piece. Um, we, we changed money by honoring our ASC's time, allowing for them to um, complete expense claims using per diems instead of individual receipts. We've learned, or we're still learning, um, to prepare honor honorarium checks in advance. Uh, and that takes a little bit of doing in a big institution. A third thing that we've changed is our facilitation strategies. We follow the lead of our co-chairs at the ASC. We sit in a circle, we open our meetings with prayer and with smudging, and we close meetings in a good way with a, with a check-in as part of a way to close. And fourth, as Diana mentioned, we're still learning to decolonize our language not to use research jargon, make sure we're speaking in a way that everybody can understand, uh, and to really be aware, uh, as Ramona mentioned earlier, of the many differences between nations. Um, so, so we're learning how to acknowledge that, that's, uh, that that exists, not to think of all First Nations people in the same way. And as we mentioned, it's a, we're a system within the academic system of UBC. So sometimes we have to push for things. Sometimes we have to go to bat to get that honorarium check ready ahead of the event. Um, or um, right now, we're trying to have UBC write a policy that allows for smudging indoors or cultural practices on U university campus wherever people choose to have cultural practices. So for influencing data collection, um, we're careful about how we ask questions. And the ASC has, has hugely contributed to how we ask some of the questions on our questionnaires. We're guided by the ASC and, and, and best practice. Um, we constantly adapt and grow our understanding about how to ask questions. Um, we use advice from the ASC, we use input from those working in the field directly, and we've also had talking circles with children to influence the way that we collect data. So here's an example of a really important question that exists actually on all, all three, or um, I think four now, of our uh, tools. Um, this is an example of the way we've written it for the childhood experience questionnaire. So it's pretty small up there, but the question is, is your child, so this is to the parent, is your child indigenous? And which nation, if yes, which nation does your child identify with? And which indigenous language group does your child identify with? One of our ASC members appreciates the respect that's been shown to the ASC by help. Rihanna says she liked the hands-on working group. She feels like ASC's opinions are being heard. Our voice is being heard, she said. Voices are actually listened to at help. So when they tell us that this question is phrased not in a way that works for them, we try and listen. Uh, at this table, Rihanna can really let her guard down and hear how it is for other nations and other people. She really likes the MDI, the Czech, and the TDI because the information actually comes from parents and from children. They were created well, she says. So an exciting thing that came from that language question, at least on the, uh, or especially on the MDI so far, uh, is that we've seen the number of children who can name their nation and language that they identify with is increasing a lot over time. 
And so we're now working with Dr. Mike Turin, uh, who's a, a language scholar at UBC, so that we can write this up in some way and share this exciting outcome. In terms of guiding uh, reporting and engagement, uh, a couple of our ASC members mentioned that one of the highlights for them over the years was developing our MDI report. This is a report that provides context about Canada's history with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people, as well as providing data back to the First Nations Chiefs and Council or those Indigenous organizations who request data and meet um, criteria specified in a protocol that was developed with our ASC. So how many in the room have heard of OCAP or no? work with the principles of OCAP? Okay, not that many. Um, I'm going to gloss over it a little bit fast, but if you have questions at the end, please, please do. It stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession, and, and really is a guide for researchers in how, how to ensure that, that as much as we possibly can, the data is owned and controlled and accessed by the people who produced it, so in this case with First Nations, Inuit, or Métis people. So just by way of example there, in, in our case, we're really thinking deeply about who owns the data, how, do, how in our context do nations own the data, uh, how can we ensure that nations have control over the data, um, we've taken advice from our ASC, we make sure that our, our data is not shared publicly, data is accessed by letter of request following a protocol that was developed with our ASC. Uh, and in our case, the data is stored at help, but we're really thinking deeply about um, how do we do this better? How do we do OCAP uh, in the best way possible? So the ASC has also helped us uh, in our training for teachers. So because um, teachers sometimes administer the MDI for their grade four and seven students and they complete a questionnaire for their kindergartners, it's important that they understand that identity and language question. So we've produced a video and have training materials so that we hope that we're actually uh, increasing the capacity within the school system to understand these things. And I've got a quote from Denise on our ASC who said, this is one of the groups where there's truly meaningful engagement. It's not an afterthought to have the ASC contribute and it's meaningful for both parties. We are benefiting for our people as well. It feels like we are members of the team. Diana and I talked about being able to get some of your wisdom in the room, because we've been here talking, but we know that you have a lot to say, um, possibly about research and relationships between Indigenous organizations and researchers. I mentioned earlier a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to research in Indigenous communities. When the EDI first started rolling out and... Out of the 137-ish banned schools, we've had very low participation rates, but because I travel around the province, I get to go to our AIDP programs, the preschools, the Head Start programs, and I hear, I hear talk in the communities, and I went to a Strong Start program in one of the communities. Everybody knows the Strong Start programs. And the, uh, we, they just happened to be talking about um, the help and, and the research project. And, um, and this is the, 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 the bad or the ugly part. That is a point of, of maybe why we may not be concerned about, or we might not want to be part of the project or take part in research, is, the, is just that fear, just that, okay, we're going to be judged, we're going to be compared. Um, all of the bias, all of that of how people think about us as a, as a population. So I wanted to share that. And I just wanted to quickly share, <coughs> when we say we, um, I've been cautioned not to say we, because we could mean so many different things. But when we're talking about working with children with special needs, well, we have this in Vancouver. We have this. We have children's hostel. We have this. We have this. We have this. If you're from a remote community up in the province of BC, there is no we up there. They don't have access. So there's people, let's say, we have this. We do this. We have um, autism. We have 
um, this this place. We have physio. We have this building. We have this. Um, I, I know people who, who uh, communities who have a speech and language pathologist come in, and she said four days. I went wow, thinking she meant four days a month because some have only had you know two or three days a month. So when I heard she had a speech and language four days a month, I went wow, and she goes no, a year. So that community only got an SLP once a year for four days. So I want us to be careful about the we. And, and again, to go back to that pan-Aboriginal, when I say we, I'm not speaking for all 203 nations. I'm mostly speaking about we as Cowichan or maybe Nuchalneth or AIDP. So I just want us to be conscientious about that royal word we. And... Um, I, I think I think that's all I wanted to add for now. I just I just I just wanted to add those pieces, just about why there might be reservations because um, uh, the mainstream population or the larger system, if they just want to remove us to make them look better, then that's not a good way to start. Um, so I wanted to mention that. We'll end on a positive note, but I still wanted to mention that. <laughs>